Good morning. It's such a great pleasure to meet Terry uh, this week, and I'm really honored, uh, Terry and the CSWE, for inviting me to this Hockenstadt International Lecture. It's an uh, amazing uh, group of, uh, I would say, global social workers. You are doing tremendous work in the areas that are um, challenging and uh, exciting because the world is changing so fast and uh, um, I'm so thrilled to meet someone so young who is so interested in international welfare. And Terry, <laughs> you're, you're really young at heart as it is. And uh, it's good to meet old friends and good friends. Uh, and I think many of you here uh, would, uh, would be my teachers in, in the area of international work. And uh, I am really, really honored uh, to share with you some of my thoughts today. Um, the topic that I have uh, given is the new frontiers of international social work. Is there east-west divide? And if you see the color code there, I will, uh, I will also talk a little bit about whether there is a divide here in the U.S. Uh, between two significant uh, camps. Most of you would have heard of the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, uh, Rudyard Kipling. And in his poem, in the Ballad of the East and West, Kipling said, O oh, East is East, and West is West, and never the twin shall meet, till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat. But there is neither east nor west, border nor breed nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. Many people know the first part of this poem, but the last part is actually very significant, and it gives us the clue of how east can meet west or would they meet someday? I believe the East is marching on in this decade and in the last three decades and is rising rapidly as not just an economic power but also in the social political arena. Some years back we always uh, were told we got to look to Japan because Japan was a rising economic power. and. Uh, I think right now the eyes are mainly on China and India because of the great economic uh, miracle and uh, recovery even after the 97 uh, economic downturn. It's recovering fast and the growth rate is sometimes in the double digits but certainly in the high, uh, in 7-8% of annual growth. And we find that with economic and political power, the relationships have changed. And uh, if you have been to China uh, or India 20 years ago and now, is vastly uh, different. And the progress is steady, but there are still lots of uncertainties in Asia. As we see what's happening in the Middle East uh, and the Western Asia, you find that uh, there are lots of political uncertainties still. And uh, I know um, IASSW has been engaging uh, uh, Middle East countries in the area of social work and social work education. And um, it's not easy, uh, but it's steady and uh, it, will, it will come someday. As we see the social political changes, we also see the social work arena expanding in Asia. And social work has progressed rapidly, but it also varies greatly by country. 
For example, Philippines, India, Malaysia, they have a longer history of uh, social work uh, compared to Vietnam and Indonesia, and I know ICSD has been engaging Indonesia and IFSW. Uh, when I was the vice president, we brought Indonesia to be a member country of IFSW. And uh, around that time also, we were re-engaging Pakistan to be a member, as well as China became a member. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the development of social work in Asia. So we find that the countries develop differently. Those with the British background uh, colonies had the I wonder whether it's fortune or misfortune of having the uh, uh, British heritage and the British model of social work, which had been very much case work. Uh, I think uh, the ideas of Florence Hollis and you know um, psychosocial work, social work is uh, is very much in the forefront. And I think it's harder to break out of the mall to go into more community-focused approaches because of the heritage that was left. But yet, I think there is the change because the cultural context demands that you do not take a micro approach to uh, issues that confront human lives. What I would like to do in the next uh, half an hour or so, is to uh, bring us through the changes due to globalization and compare the East and the West. And my main thesis is that in the process of change, we will find the new frontiers of social work. And uh, I would like to focus on some of the problems and the development in Asian social work and I will deal briefly with the idea of what does indigenization and cultural context mean in Asia and then lead on to talk about cultural values and agenda for action. And I have a couple of proposals in remaking social work and hopefully it is not just Asia but the world. And I will end up with our million dollar question is there a clash between the East and the West? And I think most of you know the answer already. You want to have a head start on that? <laughs> Go back to Kipling. <laughs> Times have changed. The world today is vastly different from when social work began in the late 1800s, or at least modern social work in the late 1800s and early 1900s. I remember pouring through the files of the Family Services of America, uh, dated 1905, out of the archives at the U of M uh, library, because Clark Chambers, our history professor, is such a darling, he, he makes sure that all these records are, are kept. And uh, although the times have changed, some of the fundamental issues of human existence and human relationships are still there. What I am alluding to is that although we have new frontiers, there could be actually a rematch of the old issues within the modern context. So, although our technology have changed, although the uh, lifestyle has changed, although the expectations of what it means to have a good life may have changed, there are still some basic elements of human needs and human endeavors that are universal and as they are historically the same. And 
in a way, globalization has brought a new economy and a new world approach. We are stuck in this chrono system where we have to look at the rising expectations of people and the new context that we are living in. And if you have been a grandparent or you are a grandparent, you would know that the new generation is so different. And I just became a grandfather a month ago. You find that we say we are living in a different world. And yet, the joys of human relating, the issues that a new baby or old person present would be fundamentally unchanged. When we look at new social problems that have arisen, we realize that they are not just local issues and concerns. They are concerns not only in America, but they are concerns in Tanzania and in um, Hong Kong or as far as Papua New Guinea. And we are engaging Papua New Guinea in the Asia Pacific region and they have also become a member of IFSW. But globalization is pervasive and it has impacts on all levels of society and concomitant with globalization is the transformation of economies from an industrial or from an agricultural agrarian society in most uh, developing world to an industrial market oriented system. And we can see that especially so in uh, the more centrally controlled economy like Russia, uh, USSR, and uh, China and Vietnam. And once the opening up, you find that there is a kind of a new ball game altogether in terms of how people uh, survive that system and how they can improve their own social well-being. And we find that this has been wrought through the process of globalization, modernization. I remember t reading Chinese history uh, in my undergraduate days, and you find that the Chinese civilization and the Asian civilization, for that matter, has always resisted being westernized. And uh, there is the uh, Ti Yong principle in uh, China that is, you will take, out, take what is good in technology, but re make sure the culture and the values remain uh, so that there is a balance between the East and the West uh, in even the process of urbanization, uh, globalization, and cultural change. How has that impacted international social work? We find that the social agenda has always been towards social justice and a progress that can bring about peace and goodwill between people. A progress that is moderated by a care for the social condition and social development of all people, not just the rich and uh, those who can uh, have economic means. But we find that globalization has really increased the income gap and the, the Gini index for China, for example, has been rising and in, in Singapore as well and in India. And that's the way by the society is uh, constructed that those with the uh, means and technology and the uh, economic power will gain more and therefore uh, the, the gap is going to be increasing. The um, industries are more towards service and financial sector and so if you are from a agricultural base you will be sort of uh, um, left in the, um, in the fray of uh, the things. And if you are not being able to assess that technology and telecommunication, 
you will be left further and further behind. Uh, but the one thing that is interesting is that all this uh, 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 telecommunication, for example, have come in. Uh, a country like in Myanmar, they did not have landlines that is popularized, but now everybody get a cell phone. And so you leapfrog from the uh, past technology to the modern technology. And you'll find that uh, the i generation, the iPhone, iPad uh, system has begun to also revolutionize communication and uh, uh, technology. The impact of life uh, on life situations and human conditions because of globalization and industrialization, as we all know, is that there is greater social mobility, there is greater uh, um, relocation, movements of people and money, uh, and it has affected both the developed as well as the developing world. This increase migration, social disruption, the work and family stresses have become common everyday existence, life experience. We have also noticed that in many developing countries, there is a drastic rise in consumerism and in all areas, whether it is in communication technology, in transportation, in housing, in the food, and, and we all love food, and you find that the food has, has been transformed. You can, you can get any kinds of food in Singapore, and I'm sure uh, in Washington too. Uh, we just had very lovely uh, um, food last night, and uh, I kind of wonder whether it is French or is it Italian or, you know, uh, because many food have blended and uh, just like social work, I think uh, um, the, the flavors have uh, multiplied the kind of blends of, for example, curry uh, is fantastic. That you can get Japanese curry, Thai curry, Indian curry, the real stuff, right? And, uh, you know, even Malaysian curry, Singapore curry, they each have their distinct flavors. And uh, to me, curries are like, social work is like curry, you know. <laughs> there should be different blends for different uh, areas. Some like it hot and spicy. Uh, but I think social work, if it's able to be like curry, then the blending will be just right for that right context. And uh, I think the curry in America is pretty mature, the, the social work curry here. And uh, even in social work, uh, uh, the curries have many blends in, just in the USA. And, and I think uh, how do we find the right spices, the kind of uh, balance between the coconut milk which is so rich and, and uh, the chili, that was the secret to make social work tasty and appropriate for each context. So I don't know why we went into curries, but uh, that's the idea of how blending of technology with the context has made globalization and social work to have that kind of uh, special meaning. I think Asia's economy tends to be moving towards decentralization from centralization, moving towards privatization, and there is a rapid globalization, industrialization. In that, what took US and Europe maybe 150 years is being compressed in 20 years, in 30 years. And you find that it has enhanced and it has exacerbated the social problems and the kind of uh, concerns that social workers would have is drastically um, enlarged in, 
Asia. Now, before I go and dive right in into Asia, may I just recapitulate some of the Western civilization and the good things that has come out of it. There has been, in the last 200 years or so, with the new enlightenment, a strong work ethic, pragmatism, self-reliance, the kind of freedom that you can have in the Western civilization of pursuit of science, wealth, and uh, liberty of life. And I think that has come about because there is a pioneering spirit, there is that kind of emphasis on individuals having the um, freedom to explore and individuals are not serving the government, it's the, uh, it's, it's the state that has to take care of the individual, the state has to protect the individual. So the development of science and the application of this technology of industrialization has brought about on the whole a better life for Western civilization. And it has brought not only wealth to the West, but also to the different nations of the world. If you were here in the US uh, 30 years ago, you find that there were many countries in the world that came to the United States to learn the latest technology and go back. And that's how ec economic boom in Asia, in Taiwan, in Japan, started. Uh, I had some Japanese uh, colleagues in the University of Minnesota and, and they say they just want to learn and then go back and use it for, the, for their country. So the wealth of nations have in, increased. But again, as we see the wealth of nations increase, the, the wealth disparities between nations have also increased. The wealth within nations have also, the gap has also widened. But what I wanted to say in this part of the Western civilization is that it has set a pace for the global era because modern social work has taken off in a very significant way in the US and in England and in uh, Europe. And that helps us to see that there are fundamentals in social work that can contribute to enhancing human welfare. But in the same time, we'll find that there are new problems that have emerged in Asia. And uh, I think just about that time that we were traveling, uh, you find that SARS was a big scare and the flu epidemic that has taken its toll on human lives and the economy. And we find that social workers, whether it's in the East or in the West, have arisen to this call. And because this happened in Hong Kong, uh, more and more social workers in Hong Kong were involved with uh, working with patients as well as their families, and not only that, but also within the communities in helping victims and those who have been affected by SARS, the businesses and the um, different uh, organizations that were involved. Uh, for example, the community organizing and the societal support that came out uh, of SARS uh, in Singapore has really strengthened the community and it is partly due, not all, to social work intervention of organizing community groups to support each other and uh, the way of education as well as the public response to grief and to the crisis. There is a poem in China that says that uh, um, out of disaster there could come blessing. Out of 
problems, we will find hope. You will find that the tsunami and the disasters of uh, uh, December 20, 2004, uh, uh, the Asian tsunami, and then the uh, Japan recently as well, uh, in 2010, um, has brought the, um, the world community together as well, and uh, there is a, a key social work response. And I am uh, privileged to be part of that international response through the International Federation of Social Workers. I have just completed my term as the uh, Vice President of IFSW and being the regional uh, uh, leader, I've got uh, the um, Commonwealth Organization and many associations of social workers together to uh, spearhead the FAST project. And families and survivors of tsunami basically was a targeted uh, short-term uh, project that is aimed at building capacity, being catalyst to the change process. And what we have identified then in Sri Lanka, in Indonesia, in India, and in Thailand were collaborators in right there on the ground and helping them to um, make appropriate social work professional uh, uh, intervention and uh, presence in the whole process. For example, in Sri Lanka, we um, started the um, training of uh, BSW uh, uh, workers and diploma in social work workers and they were deployed in Hambantota, a district that was uh, very severely affected by the tsunami. And they had three projects there, a home garden for widows uh, who, uh, who had this self-help and with the Department of Agriculture begin to grow herbs that will be sold in the market. And uh, they, when their livelihoods have been washed away, they were able to sustain uh, 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 certain uh, lifestyle and salary uh, from the growing of these home gardens and herbs. And the social work uh, uh, um, student, actually, uh, when I visited them, was uh, having uh, a group work together with these widows in the time between their uh, tending to the herbs and the crops. And so there was the home garden project and there was also a micro enterprise project. Um, and this project was, uh, later on you will see a, a picture of that, um, was in, the, in, a, in a monastery, in a Sri Lankan monastery, but attended by Christians by Muslims and by um, Buddhists. And it was an enterprise where they were doing home uh, industries and for sale, and that again is an economic, but the social political part was the integration of the different communities and also the interaction and support they find in each other in the times of crisis. And uh, there was also another project of the children and children's uh, rehabilitation through uh, uh, group work. And so we find, uh, actually in this picture here, it's in Aceh actually, it's in um, the, the town of uh, Aceh, which is most severely affected by the uh, earthquake and then the tsunami that happened after the earthquake. And uh, this is the camp when I visited three weeks after the dis disaster and they were transitioned. And what we were doing is the Indonesian social work students, and not all of them were even social work students, uh, came together and they did uh, uh, um, 
children's groups and children's education, and they and I was suggesting to them to enlist the teenagers uh, who were just standing around uh, in the in the in the whole process, and so the children's camp, and so we find that the whole project uh, in Sri Lanka, for example, took off greatly, and. Uh, um, a Japanese foundation then continued funding the projects and, and it, was, uh, it was very successful, uh, although it started very small. And the, uh, the project in, the, in Aceh uh, was on child protection and was training of the child protection workers and the Indonesian uh, uh, associations of professional social workers were greatly involved in the training process with some assistance from the international community. And again, that project was taken over by UNICEF and the UNICEF funding, I understand, continued even two years after the project. So what we find that social work response uh, has to be uh, timed in the right way and it may not be big, it could be just a catalytic way whereby we see where the need is, how we build capacity and how we enable the sustainability of that kind of project and I think that has been a great uh, uh, learning uh, lesson for me of empowerment, of capacity building. And we find that now IFSW reports that there is an increase of social work capacity to contribute to disaster prevention, mitigation, response and recovery. And uh, we have also the book, as was mentioned by Mark, The Asian Tsunami and Social Work Practice that has been uh, uh, published by Hayworth. And uh, these are the Indonesian colleagues. But the idea here is that social work must not do it alone and the, the value of social work is the ability to harness community resources to augment the professional intervention and also there is a need to look at how it can be sustained, how prevention and developmental strategies must already be in the forefront as we go in and uh, the UN colleagues that I talk with, uh, the World Bank, the uh, UNICEF, says, what is your exit strategy? I say, we are already there because the colleagues who are there in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, are the ones doing it. And therefore, there is the great sustainability. Another issue in Asia, and I suspect not just in Asia, but Africa and all over the world, is the area of dealing with change and uh, conflicts. Oh, I just realized that I might have to move very fast. Is it okay if I just skipped some of this? Um, yes, okay. And uh, because there are some good stuff further down, so uh, I'll, I'll move. Okay. Um, I, I know that this is an issue that we all say change change also brings about conflict and conflict has to be resolved and uh, my own thinking in Asia is that it is the marginalized group that has to be empowered and, and has to be actively participating in the process of change whether it's social, economic or political change. Let me turn to Asia and specifically a case study in China that the growth of Asian social work is so phenomenal that uh, China actually is a very unique case. In 1952, social work education was abandoned because the uh, Communist Party of uh, China sees that there's no need, the party is the answer to all social problems. And uh, it's only restored recently in 1988 with the founding of the China Association of Social Workers uh, in 1991 and then uh, in 1992 the uh, China joined the International Federation of Social Workers. I remember brokering that as I met with the 
president of the China Association of Social Workers, and I said uh, it will be great for you to join the IFSW fraternity. Um, and he says, yeah, we really want to. We have uh, some request, uh, and we were negotiating on the membership fee. The president uh, of the uh, China so Association said uh, we have 10,000 members. So I say, very good that you have 10,000 members. The IFSW charge $1 per member. So your fee is $10,000. Oh, he says, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, uh, so we had to relook at how many members and how the fees are paid. But uh, it was so great to have them uh, join the international fraternity. And you find that it is in the engagement that social work is being transformed in China. So uh, the China As Social Work Education Association was formed in 1994. And then uh, in 2003, we find that uh, there was suddenly, I was talking with the vice president then of IFSW and saying, how did 80,000 people get qualification of professional social work overnight? And he says, they just had an advertisement, all those who want to take the social work exam come, and the Shanghai Bureau of Civil Service gave out 80,000. So I said, so how do they practice social work? <laughs> so uh, it baffles me. So therefore, we went into an engagement and say, do they have pre-qualification? Do they have training? How do they certify and continue professional development of these social workers. And then we find that since then, the training, the certification is more regulated. And uh, uh, in 2011, there are 260 universities offering Bachelor of Social Work program. So you're going to see a new generation of social workers in China, and it's so exciting. There are 58 universities with MSW program. More than 10,000 social work students graduate annually. And uh, as we see then in 2008, there is a certificate of qualification of social work that is uh, launched. And there are two categories, the social work certificate and the assistant social worker certificate. And we find that between 2008 and 2011, there were 13,421 people who have passed the examinations and uh, for social worker and 40,000 or so have passed the examination for social work assistant. Now, there is now a pre-qualification. You need to be from a school of social work and have three years of practice in the field to take the qualification of social work. And uh, uh, if you have a master's, then you need at least one year of practice after that to take. And for the assistant, you need to be having a uh, uh, practice of at least six years in the field of social work, and then to take the assistant social workers. So we find that China is rapidly advancing and uh, they, there was a committee that had a planning with the uh, Chinese Communist Party and the State Council. And the goal is to professionalize social work. And I'm really glad to see that they were looking at professional training in, in the schools of social work. That in 2015, they want to have 2 million social workers and 3 million new social workers by 2020. And there are up to 2011, 63,000 social work positions available. And they are generally filled by non-social work trained people. Rapidly, there is also the um, development of NGOs. And there are 600 non-governmental organizations in social work in 20. 12, 2011, and you find that it has increased greatly and uh, the Chinese government has actually instituted a process of charity organizations being registered and the process. 
what I've been uh, learning as I have been in China for the past 15 years uh, is to see that with the social construction, with the rapid change, there is the great need in the area of a sound social security system for the massive population. And I think to just go into the micro social work arena is going to be a wrong strategy if it is just only uh, service-oriented social work. And I think we need to look at the broader community engagement, the whole social management approach, and the integrated social services. For example, the last week, I mean, uh, I had this email from uh, Chengdu uh, and in the province or in the area of Wenzhou in, in uh, Sichuan. They are looking at how they can relocate half a million people from the agricultural base to a transitional housing and how would be the social management model that will enhance lives uh, in uh, livelihood in the communities. And I was taken to three communities in uh, three months ago in Chengdu, and we looked at the process of urban development and how social work can play a role because already in the midst were the students on placement from the Southwest University of Finance and Economics and some of them were my students uh, uh, when I went there to teach. And, and they were looking at how they can organize residents to have that kind of self-help as well as where they can get funding and how different organizations can work together to have a greater voice in terms of getting common space and resources from the, from the political uh, machinery there. And so I think what we are looking at is that we, how, how China will develop in its own community organizing and um, um, social policy and social care uh, will be quite different from what the U.S. in the past have done. And uh, I think the basic human rights, basic interests of life is still there in every citizen, in every person, because that's the kind of uh, um, Life is uh, uh, composed of life is always yearning for a better uh, uh, kind of living for yourself, for your family, for your community. And I think that's the kind of approach that I like to see how we engage uh, Ch China or Asia or for that matter any other parts of the world. Let me quickly turn on to uh, looking at debates on indigenization and I think that's a question always people ask when you have cross-cultural social work. Uh, certainly, uh, there must be the kind of indigenization or culturally appropriate practice. And uh, the social problems that develop in each developmental journey of the nations will be different. And therefore, we need to look at what are some of the issues that confront uh, uh, most developing countries, which is the relative poverty, the kind of disasters that they will face, the kind of health and political rights that they have. Um, and therefore, the brands of social work will be suited, uh, and not just the brand, the blend of social work as well, uh, suited for the different regions and different social political contexts. In terms of indigenization is that it is inherent in our professional ethics and uh, professional values to be able to conceptualize the cultural uh, context and then the respond in the cultural sensitivity and it must be not just in the individual uh, and family oriented services and encounters but also in the community and societal response, where is the ethical aspect of engaging in a respectful, in a uh, contextual way? And I think that has to be um, the answer. 
Since we are from Penn School of Social Work, there is the functionalism that cannot be escaped. And so you must look at the contextual and the functional uh, approach to social work where, to me, a functional culture is what helps the individual, the family, the community function most effectively within that context, within that system. If it is functional, then it has to be preserved. But if it is not functional, it's unhealthy, then it has to be changed, whatever culture that may be. But I always see that behind every culture, the values can be sustained and uh, that we can look at responding to communities and contexts in a very functional way and be true to our uh, social work uh, premise of preserving culture when it is functional for the context. And therefore, social work in its practice, whether it is engaging nations, communities, or families, must be collaborative, must be equal. And therefore, if we could say, where the two strong men stand side by side and there is that kind of honor and respect given. What is peculiar about Asian social work? My thinking is that Asian social work has the informal kinship network, the private sectors, the families are all one and the institutional approach has to be uh, in the forefront and community development. And Asian value, there has been a mix from the Islamic world to the Chinese Confucian scholar. There are too many values, but fundamentally the idea is that the community and the society takes precedence over the individual. And if, if the country is doing well, the citizens will prosper. And the family is doing well, the individual will be striving. And the idea of solving problems through harmonious relations. And therefore, in ethnic situation, in different contexts, how do we deal with problems? And I think the approach there is to be participatory, to be inclusionary, and to have uh, the idea that injustices has to be dealt with but in a way that will bring about peace rather than violence in that approach. Asian welfare has very much focus on the family and uh, uh, I was at Harvard for a month debating with some of the scholars there uh, at the town school of uh, law uh, when I was doing mediation. And the idea that they have is that you cannot have a law that mandates adult children to take care of their parents. It won't work, at least in the USA. And I said, but that's inherent in most society that children take care of their parents. When that law of maintenance of parents act was introduced in Singapore, I was one of the first to respond to say, it is not by law alone. And therefore, uh, what we need is the mediation, the kind of reconciliation with families. And in that sense, more than 70% of the cases that came to the family tribunal in, uh, have been resolved already through social work intervention. So that's a kind of approach. Family still has a responsibility. It's how we negotiate. I think one of the big problems uh, uh, in China as well as in different places is the rapid urbanization and the need for social services to arise and I was in Zhuhai uh, just in June this year and the mayor of Zhuhai wants to establish 200 social services in China in Zhuhai and I said how many and how long and he says well within the next two years we want 200 so I say okay if we have 10 social workers for each agency we need 2,000 how are we going to get this and where is the training and how do we go about? But what I'm saying is that it's so exciting that the arena is open 
And my guess is that they will adopt a family approach to social services. And uh, they will look at self-help as well as civic community organizing that can sustain that kind of social services and network. But I think what is good and what is thriving in Asia still is the community spirit that can respond. So it is not just government, but it's engaging the informal sector. What do we share in common with Western social work? As you know, most of the social work educators and training came from the West. So there has been the globalization of social work and social work values and training. And I think here we have to say, with that training, how do you address the pressing issues and apply it in that context? And the context is that there is rising expectations for government to do more, and I think rightly so, but I think we should not just follow the West in government doing all, because I think the whole idea of human welfare is that it is a partnership, it is a responsibility of the individual, the family, the community, and the government. In Singapore, it's called the Many Helping Hands approach, and I think that's the approach that Asia should move to, uh, whether it is working with government, in government, they must be true to the social work values and principles, at least the original versions, and look for peaceful social change. Does being Asian then justify a top-down authoritarian government approach? And I would say categorically no, because human spirit still requires that kind of mutual respect and partnership. And I think the West have it different, but the East will handle it like, for example, in Myanmar, before the recent uh, political uh, liberalization, a little bit of that with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi being released and into government, social workers from Asia has engaged Myanmar for the last 15 years. And we have gone in to look at training of social work. We have worked with the government. We have worked with children's advocates. We have worked with uh, uh, social work educators training a new generation. And I think the process of engagement and in the little coffee talks with the generals, I say we have the same problems. We are dealing with the same issues, you know, and your people uh, 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 need this social work, uh, 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 values and ethics, and I was able to say that uh, the human spirit will always want to do better for your own and your own family. And therefore, I think the process of engagement has softened the uh, political regimes, and uh, I think the West approach is sanctions and economic and, and political pressure. I think the East will probably like more engagement, conciliatory consensus. And uh, we find that UNICEF, for example, has found a very good way into Myanmar and has done great work. And many of the UNICEF workers are social work. We have moved from traditional boundaries of social casework to intervention that is more social development approach and new links and visions for the new millennium. I would say social work should promote the responsibility of not just individual but corporate government, the corporate sponsorship and cooperation and the garnishing of these community resources. I think the challenge of social work, if I were to use McDonald's now as the approach, uh, is that McDonald's were able to adapt to different contexts. Even in Singapore, in, in, in uh, Japan, they had the samurai burger, you know, and uh, they were able to adapt to the local taste. Uh, so I think social work must be able to adapt and remake itself. These are four of the outstanding social workers who was at the President's uh, uh, Istana receiving the award just two weeks ago and all of them are my students, and it gives me hope
that the new generation of social workers have greater innovation, greater flexibility, and they are able to play the game now in a new context. And I think that's what we have to do in social work is not to change the game, but to be part of the new uh, enterprise and be able to be part of this in remaking society, the new social impact that will be more redistributive in its approach, that everyone has a fair chance, and that our focus is on enhancing good community, uh, network and relationship. We would have to engage with the technology, biotechnology at that, and involved with entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, we should be more and more cross-disciplinary and we should, as Terry has said, we should do cross-border social work, which is excellent an idea and I think uh, social work without borders, collaborative social work, I think will be the trust that uh, not only CSWE but all over the world has to be engaged in. I will look at some of the new boundaries and markers. We need greater inclusion, less territoriality, greater openness. We need to move towards greater inclusions, especially of fringe social workers. I was very amazed when I was uh, engaging with the Russian social workers uh, in the definition of the world uh, 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 definition of social work. Uh, in 1990 when it was tabled in Montreal. And he says social pedagogy uh, is part of social work. And I say, can you explain what it is? And it's basically social education and the, uh, the people that are involved in that. And uh, I was more open to looking at how we can include social educators, uh, environmental and disaster managers, as fields of social work and we will have to look at how social political activism as part of social work and it is beyond just efficacy and policy. I think we have to decrease territoriality, abolishing this in controlling social practice between states or between countries. There should be greater mobility, fraternity and exchange uh, and I think great to have the field exchanges there's greater openness that is needed and uh, I think what we have been looking at is um, developing more indigenous uh, uh, social workers like in New Zealand that they have been doing and I think it's wonderful that you find that it's a construct that they can do because there are competencies, knowledge and skills of indigenous helpers that has to be acknowledged in the social arena and they have made a very positive contribution to social intervention. Let me close by looking at clash of civilization. Huntington's idea is that when global politics occur, there will be great conflicts between nations with different ideologies and civilizations. There has been tension between East and West but I see way forward as the East, the West, all embracing the future and that we are educating for change and we are educating for a brand new world and that social work in the West has to change just as social work in the East has to grow. And the core mission of social work should remain constant and the dynamic form of international social work will evolve but our core values, our guiding principles, and uh, that we should be steadfast on this, that social work is about social change, is about human relationships, is about empowerment, is about liberation of people, it is about well-being of all citizens. And that is the fundamental approach. We need to change, social work education has to change from a, what I would call or what Jim Mitchley has called the imperialism of the West to a more approach of partnering and partnership. Uh, I was part of the document of the IFSW and IASSW document on the standards of social work training and it was quite embarrassing for me to acknowledge that it looked like CSWE document. And um, 
but there are lots of good stuff in there. It's just that where are the differentiation between cultures? I would say the vision is that we could deliver quality training to where there is need, and that would be the mandate of social work education. And uh, uh, we have been talking this week about a proposal to uh, launch a global institute of social work. And this proposal is that the global institute will be a, essentially uh, uh, riding on new technology of delivering online virtual training, timely, that is useful. And it is uh, not to replace the formalized training in the schools, but it is to augment that from the various countries in the world and actually to point towards that in the future. And uh, the idea here is that social training should be available to frontline social workers who are doing a fantastic job, but they can be even better once we have that kind of uh, assistance and collaboration. The idea that I have, and I've talked to if, uh, President of IASSW, and uh, we hope to collaborate with different organizations working together for the training of social workers and also possible practical attachment training projects and collaborative projects. So the support from different members will be important and technical support, but I think that's the way forward to popularize social work education to make it available quality where it is needed. In rounding up that the Western models will have to change with new ways society is organized, it's inevitable, and social work in Asia, in America, will have to meet the demands of the 21st century world. The East will meet the West when both recognize their strengths and respect differences and renewed commitment to contextualize practice Yes, we should develop standards of social work, we should move the banner high, but we should be more inclusive and we could enhance the value of social work practice, we could enhance the value of social work education whether East or West. Now to paraphrase a very famous person uh, who recently got re-elected, we are not the Eastern world, we are not the Western world, we are one united world. We are not so divided as our cultures suggest, we are all in this together. Colleagues, social workers of the world, unite. Thank you. Dr. Tan, uh, we have a few minutes for perhaps one or two questions. I uh, just want to say in concluding comments to myself, uh, if I can paraphrase my mother-in-law, you have taught me once again that we are, although are different, we are still the same. And I also I was very intrigued by watching the ghost of uh, uh, Ruth Smalley and Otto Ronk come through the room as we discuss functional social work. And finally, I think one of the takeaways for me is how social work is like curry around the world. I won't think I will forget that in a long time. So uh, uh, do we have one or two questions from the floor uh, that you would like to address to Dr. Tan? Yes. You mentioned uh, Did, did you say innovations? Indigenization. Indigenization. I think um, social workers are so adaptable. They are indigenizing every moment. And uh, I would say um, indigenization is basically an application of what you learn to the context and the culture. And so um, I think um, um, certainly in the West, um, <clears throat> there are various forms of, say, indigenous practice with Native Americans, uh, indigenous practice uh, with uh, minority communities, and uh, we are learning as much from you. And therefore, in the East, uh, I'm looking at more indigenization 
of social work, including more uh, uh, the extended family, for example, in our intervention, and bringing in community resources, which are actually uh, the uh, real uh, social work approaches. Social work approach in the beginning has always been looking at a systemic approach to social intervention. And so I would say systemic intervention uh, in its uh, pure and ideal way is really indigenizing uh, social work practice. Thank you. Time for one more question if there is one. Yes. Gundra, such a pleasure to have you. At the same time, I think there's a lot of thinking that we need to do in terms of the term we are using when we are looking at because there may be contradictions. For example, if on the one hand we know which is embedded within the structural functionalist approach, which may be dominant, dominant for certain kinds of societies, versus the radical practice approach. I mean, giving the example of China, would we be able to, for example, go in and talk about community empowerment processes and radical practice versus the structural... So, uh, I think that you, your presentation, we don't have time really to dialogue, but uh, I would really like to take forward this uh, dialogue with you there's so many concepts have been wonderful. Mm. Thank you, Vimla. I think that is wonderful, a very wise and um, uh, appropriate uh, discussion that we should take on how it's contextualized. How would we engage uh, the uh, social welfare director of Myanmar now in that kind of context? And how do we bring about change in a way that will not uh, be thrown out of Myanmar for social work to be, to be part of the whole change process is exciting. And, and I think it is a, a, a very creative, innovative approach that has to be uh, appropriate for a country like Myanmar. And I have every intention to engage in that way and uh, uh, in China also. But you see, there are greater open doors when you engage than to exclude. And therefore, when you engage, there are great potential ahead. And um, uh, since Vemla was saying, uh, we are looking at the proposed Global Institute of Social Work as a place to engage social workers without borders now. They can download training right up there and, and I'm thankful that Vimla is very supportive. And let's see how the collaboration with IASSW, with IFSW, and with uh, ICSW and CSWE can move this forward. Uh, if you have ideas and suggestions, uh, may I ask you to uh, uh, send me an email or, or tell me how we could move this forward and uh, uh, I'll be very interested on your ideas of how we can take Global Institute of Social Work to the new frontiers of social work uh, intervention uh, in the 21st century. Thank you very much.